starting good evening everyone today is 11th july 2020 on behalf of indian public health association ipha we observe these special days and today is one of such special day that is world population day so it was start long back in 1989 by unfpa and the, this this year's theme for world population day is awareness and vulnerabilities related to women and girls sexual and reproductive health which which is a major concern for us nowadays so today we have with us is author of medical science working as professor and he is our national president of indian public health association next we have dr shanghamitra ghosh the secretary general of indian public health association and working with the ministry of defense and of india we have dr shoma chakraborty she is an eminent gynecologist and working in diamond harbor medical college and hospital we have us ruta gupta who was a journalist and now working and as founder president of up women worldwide also us dr shashwat ghosh he is associate professor id kolkata so before starting i the, there are some rules all of you mute yourself or it, and you will get a link when you leave the seminar uh, webinar at the end and if you fill up the link you will get the e certificate so in the link there will be a feedback form today's discussion is dr shanghamitra ghosh madam please good evening everybody today 11 july 2020 this world population focus day. attention on the urgency and importance of population issues was established by the the then governing council of the united nation development program in 1989 an outgrowth of the interest generated by the day of 5 billion which was observed on 11 july 1987 i request dr sanjay rai president ipha professor at center for community medicine in delhi to say a few word on this dr simitra um, thank you and uh, namaskar all the dignitaries attending this live panel discussion on this special occasion of the world population day my colleague and secretary general indian public health association dr simitra ghos our central council member of the indian public health association Dr. Kosik Mitra, Dr. Rivi Vasu, our eminent panelist, Dr. Saswat Ghos, Dr. Somjita Chakravarti, Ms. Ruchira Gupta, our most valued member of the Indian Public Health Association, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thanks and congratulate my Secretary General, Dr. Sang Mitra. and her team for picking a very relevant topic in the current scenario of this current covid pandemic situation this was entirely her idea to have this panel discussion on the occasion of the world public day <clears throat> um it's a great honor for me to, to share this special occasion with all of you and on behalf of indian public health association i extend my warm welcome to all of you who all are attending this panel discussion we all know that this um, uh, world um, uh, population day is an annual event um, observed on every uh, uh, month uh, sorry every year on 11th july since last more than 30 years as mentioned by dr kosik also and dr sanmitra also that uh, undp started in 1989 and since then every year we celebrate this world population day the main objective of this is to awareness the various population related issues um globally and as mentioned by our secretary general that this year 
um, the theme of the this world population day is how to safeguard the health and right of the women and girls now but this theme also features uh, focus on keeping women and girls healthy especially during this pandemic uh, period we all know there is no doubt that this pandemic that is the covid pandemic has placed an overwhelming health and economic burden on the entire world and the health and right of the women are also badly affected due to this um, covid um this is an estimate um, um, released by this um, um un agency various un agency that all over world around 47 million women from the middle and low income especially from the middle and low income countries will not have the access to the basic modern contraceptive method which will result in about 7 million unwanted and unintended pregnancy and this is is not only related to child birth <clears throat> and but also related to various other social problem like child marriage female uh, this genital mutilation etc this is and our country is not different from other part of the world almost situation is same everywhere in this also uh, there are many uh, incidences and um, the national women commission reported um, uh, huge rise in number of the domestic violence so this list is endless i'm not going to discuss the entire list of the various health problem but definitely it's a major problem and our, our association has been working for the cause of public health since its inception more than since last more than 6 60 years and for this important issue also um, uh, this uh, public health issue we are supporting the global community so friends let's work together for the cause of public health issue either it's a gender issue population issue or this um, women empowerment issue our goal is to have a better and healthier india with these words once again i welcome you to this live panel discussion on the occasion of the world population day and hope you will enjoy this special moment of academic day jai hind long live indian public health association namaskar thank you dr rai world population uh, population day's main objective is to increase people's awareness of various population issues that also include the importance of gender equality maternal health family planning poverty and human rights so as the entire world is fighting a global pandemic nothing grand can be held in order to celebrate and raise awareness on the world population day however this year's theme for world population day is mainly focused on protecting and safeguarding the rights of women from all around the world the theme of world population day 2020 also focuses on keeping women and girls healthy especially during the time of a pandemic population growth constantly acts as a hurdle in effectively addressing the problem of poverty hunger and malnutrition and in providing the better quality of health and education with limited resources covid-19 has accentuated these challenges and also raised concerns on the timely attainment of un sustainable goals sdgs it is therefore important to understand that in order to have a better future for all on a healthy planet attainment of sdgs is critical i request our first speaker dr shashwat ghosh associate professor idsk to tell us about population goal in sdgs dr shashwat ghosh please hey. can you see the slides yeah thank um, uh, thank you uh, dr ghosh and uh, other uh, distinguished uh, panelists and uh, doctors and uh, public health researcher uh, to invite me uh, in this uh, august gathering of the doctors and uh, public health researchers in india 
so the uh, topic what uh, i am going to tell is the uh, population goals in sdgs uh, in the light of uh, covid 19 pandemic uh, as you know that the sdgs has total 17 goals 169 targets and 232 indicators this is a huge 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 affair and it starts with no poverty and end its end at uh, partnerships for the achieving goals and uh, there are issues covering all aspects of the life starting from the hunger to good health and well being to education to gender to clean water uh, uh, to climate action and peace and justice reduced in uh, inequalities and so on and so forth so uh, and uh, the motto of the goal is is uh, no one should leave behind i mean it is a all encompassing issue <clears throat> now how these goals are will be affected and uh, and uh, whether we we can meet it within the 2030 as targeted earlier or we have to defer it something like that 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 is the issue what i am going to tell you as the uh, even secretary general himself uh, issued a statement that the as member state recognized at the summit held at last september global efforts to date have been insufficient to deliver the change we need and actually it is uh, now due to covid 19 uh, pandemic and unprecedented health economic and social crisis is threatening lives and even as it is made very difficult to achieve the goals now uh, if we see this uh, um, uh, simple bar diagram that the progress on the uh, sdgs uh, that was i mean east and south east asia was doing better compared to other uh, other regions and uh, Um, uh, and the thing is that uh, this is uh, changed since uh, 2015 to score in 2020 so it is not uh, i mean the east and south asian countries together they were not doing uh, bad actually compared to the other uh, other uh, actually the uh, regions now this covid 19 pandemic will severely i mean will have severe negative impacts on most of the sdgs according to the report which has been published uh, by the undp itself and the uh, report said the covid 19 have negatively affected several goals which is including no poverty uh, i mean sdg 1 uh, 2 uh, uh, zero hunger sdg 3 good health and well being and sdg 8 decent work and economic growth SDG 10 uh, reduced inequalities. At the same time, the pandemic have brought some immediate relief. Some immediate relief. It is immediate uh, in the, the areas related to the responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, and life on land. But again, uh, with a rider that these these uh, these immediate relief. may or may not sustain in future and may have negative impact altogether now crucially in many parts of the world the pandemic uh, and its effect are being exacerbated by the crisis in delivering on clean water and sanitation target because in the uh, pandemic you require this running water and good sanitation issues and weak uh, economic growth and absence of the decent water pervasive inequalities and above all the crisis of uh, poverty and food security now uh, covid 19 could push up to 400 uh, million people into extreme poverty as defined by the world bank uh, definition us uh, achieving uh, us dollar 1.9 per day which is the average poverty line and uh, it may raises to the 500 million if we uh, use the world bank's uh, higher average poverty line the potential increase is driven by the millions of the people just above the just above the poverty line they are likely to be badly affected because many of them work in the informal sector where 
uh, there is no issue of the social security and from the demographic point of view globally particularly in the europe america china these countries um, there will be a significant impact on the structure co residential pattern family structure as well as in on mobility now let me talk about the what are the challenges uh, india is going to face and currently is facing before the pandemic uh, pandemic india's progress was relatively was, was not very impressive it uh, out of 100 it, its score was uh, 61 point something and uh, its score was actually lower compared to the um, uh, pakistan and even afghanistan india faces actually major challenges uh, uh, in all the 10 of the uh, 17 sdgs which uh, particularly which uh, uh, i am going to actually discuss today the zero hunger uh, good health and gender inequality i will first take up the issue on the good health and um, uh, gender inequality and then i will talk uh, talk about the zero hunger there are significant challenges in other three uh, uh, these things like uh, SDG 1, uh, 14 and 15. Although the number of children uh, who are actually affected and died in uh, COVID pandemic is actually very less, but uh, as uh, compared to the uh, elderly and uh, adults, the impact of pandemic on their growth and protection against infectious diseases has been severely impacted because of the lack of timely vaccination and improper nutrition. The, and we know the relationship between the GDP and the infant mortality rate. Uh, and uh, falling actually, GDP will actually going to hamper the expenditure on the non-COVID areas. And as a result, the IMR and um, uh, child mortality rate CMR would likely to increase in the near future in post-COVID situation and particularly in the states uh, that uh, EAG states, empowered action group states like Bihar, UP, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Rajasthan, etc. And uh, it actually, it has a potential to reveal, uh, reversing the significant success in the reducing IMR and CMR in the past few years, which we have actually done. Apart from GDP, since the entire health system is on the COVID management, the institutional deliveries, the neonatal health, etc., would bound to be compromised and enhance the risk of child death. Now, based on a uh, recent study published in Lancet, uh, UNICEF is, uh, has actually predicted that uh, 3 lakh children could die in India over the next six months as the health outreach services are reduced and child wasting increases during the pandemic situation because of the uh, nutrition risk profile of the indian population was already already actually very fragile you know the the state of bihar is uh, continuously struggling with this uh, stunting the issue of stunting as an uh, issue of wasting and there is a decline um, and there is a decline of one percentage per year it is actually very very less and uh, that if it doesn't come as a huge shock that the country and uh, it has the highest burden in terms of the number as <coughs> the stresses of the uh, pandemic are weakening and an already uh, weak health system in the already weak health system the virus containment measures announced by the government ended up disrupting food security programs and nutrition delivery for women and children as e school shut so mid day meal uh, uh, program also and uh, and uh, it is already established that the mid day meal programs are one of the major source of uh, nutrition in particularly in the eag states where the burden of the uh, under nutrition is also very high in pockets where the dry ration was uh, distributed it couldn't have fully com uh, compensated the need of the child when the in uh, entire family was struggling for the food as our health workers ashas and the angarwadis uh, as well as the AMMs, were given additional responsibility related to the um, uh, pandemic their focus on the nutritional status of the children suffered 
constant access to clinics, social workers, uh, water and sanitation under the current situation will adversely impact children. These shocks can push borderline cases into the malnutrition bucket. If that happens, many severely undernourished, uh, malnourished um, uh, children could face near death situation and those suffering from the moderate nutrition could slip into severe mal malnutrition. And there is also another issue which is in, related to particularly in the villages uh, that uh, the stigma uh, among these uh, Asas, ANM, Angarbalis because they are actually managing this uh, migrant uh, worker and uh, who are actually may or may not have the in, uh, infection. So there is a high uh, high meets or high um, what do you call that uh, uh, stigmatization among them that uh, if the ANM and the ASHA actually visit uh, or the Anganwadi workers visit to my home, then there will be a high chance of uh, contracting such kind of uh, uh, diseases. Now, infectious diseases uh, requiring continuous support of the health system. Patients with TV and HIV AIDS need continuous supply of medicine. Interruptions in, in the intake of medicine are actually getting frequent. Similar in the cases of NCDs, particularly patients with the malignant neuropathy. Medical and uh, surgical emergencies, including the road accidents, get neglected when the entire health system is engaged in combating pandemic. Elderly care and healthy aging would also likely to be compromised, particularly those living alone. It is expected that the older uh, widow and widowers uh, would be the worst sufferer of the pandemic situation. Pandemic situation would like to have impact on the living arrangement of the elderly and their economic independence. Prolonged lockdown and the issue of the mental well-being. I mean, it is already, you have seen uh, many cases of such, but all are anecdotal evidences, but it, uh, it is general that uh, given the future uncertainty, if, uh, the uh, anxiety will enhance depression, suicidal uh, tendencies and substance abuse, all these things among children and young, young adults may increase. By uh, most measure, violence against women already represent a global um, health pandemic, uh, health epidemic. Worldwide, uh, more than one in three women have experienced physical and or sexual uh, intimate uh, partner violence or non-partner non sexual violence uh, in, uh, in their lifetime. This crisis is actually likely to be worsened as a result of uh, COVID-19, particularly in case of India. Un um, unwanted uh, pregnancies, uh, lack of supply of the contraceptive measures is likely to worsen the uh, burden of the unwanted child and particularly in the this uh, empowered action group states where these unwanted uh, children i mean i'm talking about the fihar uh, where according to the national family health survey 2015-16 uh, one one child per woman is actually unwanted unwanted so it is actually likely to increase the burden of the uh, within the family, in the society, and in the uh, country. <coughs> Women's um, employment in the uh, health sector is proportionately exposed in, again, to the COVID-19 because, I mean, most of the uh, women's uh, work is in the in, uh, informal sector, actually, settings, and that actually heightens their vulnerabilities during the crisis. Uh, NCW, actually, uh, which receives complaints of domestic violence from across the country, has recorded more than twofold rise in the gender violence in the national uh, lockdown period. There is simply no chance, no chance of being able to achieve uh, either sustainable development goal one, that is the ending poverty in all forms, 
everywhere or the SDG 3 that is ensuring healthy lives and promoting the well-being of them. The present pandemic uh, brought actually two serious errors in the system. One is the, uh, the first is with regard to understanding the nature and extent of the poverty. And second is our low investment in publicly funded provisioning of uh, quality healthcare to actually reduce inequality. Uh, uh, if you see the data uh, um, in two, uh, 2009-10, I mean, four, 455 million poor instead of uh, actually 350 million, uh, 355 uh, million poor. Uh, if we take the Rangarajan Committee's poverty line, and uh, uh, instead of the uh, Tendulkar committees, uh, that uh, definition of the poverty line. In fact, we have uh, stopped the estimating after the, uh, the poverty after 2011-12, but that didn't make the poverty problem go away. We are not counting. That is the issue. The commitment to give free cereals to 800 million people in a uh, in um, uh, in a 1.7 crore uh, lakh crore in relief package announced by the in Indian Finance Minister is a sign that the government realized the gravity of the poverty situation in India and uh, severe distress unleashed uh, by the lockdown. But I mean, I would say that this is I mean very very less what has been announced. Uh, the lockdown led to the closure of business, joblessness, and extreme distress, uh, ex exposing the vulnerability of a large proportion of the population. Most of them depend on the money earned today, or at most this month to survive. This has exacerbated and uh, placed the poverty problem center stage and Denial is no longer, probably no longer possible. Now, pandemic has uh, has a two kind of economic impact. First, it has uh, it caused the immediate losses that uh, people can recover over the next year or so, and uh, also uh, there is a if we put a player, uh, if the system is in place, then the large size citizen to citizen direct cash transfer system, uh, a lot of Indians will be able to get back on their feet much faster. But the uh, government is actually in, uh, indifferent to this particular issue. Even in the absence of the cash transfer, the wage support from the government that might have ameliorated uh, some of the sufferings. A lot of people are already back on their feet and will be able to rebuild their lives as the economy picks up, especially if bank starts lending in response to the government's liquidity promoting policy announcement. But again, there is a problem that the government, uh, I mean, the banks are in fear to give any kind of loan. Uh, those who, uh, who have no actually asset or, I mean, they are their capability of uh, uh, that, I mean, repaying the loan. But uh, you uh, you know the fact is that the this uh, those who are uh, who are actually uh, taking loans from the banks, they are um, generally um, repaid. And the study says that around ninety three percent of the middle class and the this uh, lower um, uh, lower segment of the population, they actually repay. But the problem actually lies to the rich people to actually um, uh, repay the loan. And the um, second um, second kind of the impact will be Korea's more that the uh, one uh, where the setback uh, from the pandemic lands a blow on an individual life chances. Those hit by such uh, such uh, setbacks might not only be harder to identify, but more difficult to provide for given a 
prevailing narratives of vulnerability and social justice. Uh, and uh, these long term setbacks fall into at least four categories. Now, this is a uh, map. I mean, it is uh, prepared by the uh, UNDSA that uh, how it is actually going to suffer in uh, this COVID pandemic is how it is uh, going to affect. Dr. Shah, yeah, yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, can you just conclude after some yeah, time? Yeah, 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 yeah please, please. I'm just uh, lost one slide. Uh, so, uh, now, uh, to actually conclude, if the uh, pandemic raises the stakes but gives uh, permission for change, even before this pandemic, the uh, progress against the SDGs was stalling. With the, with the pandemic, we, we must forge a new path that drives us towards um, that better future. And rather than assume that the uh, pandemic makes this uh, Task harder, we would uh, capitalize on the opportunity and the uh, space it actually provides to uh, challenge the conventional wisdom. And uh, it is actually a, a common framework is actually required. And so, investors and uh, enterprises have uh, parameters to measure, manage, and communicate their SCG contribution in a consistent and a transparent manner. And also there is a uh, issue related to the uh, private equity funds and enterprises. Now, uh, there are challenges to actually get up the resources, which is uh, very obvious. Now, uh, what will be the uh, new normal post uh, COVID-19 in general? I mean, uh, it is very hard to talk about this now because I mean, uh, future is there. So one is the uh, consumption will be lower home schooling, work from home, digital transformation, era of uh, personalized marketing, and automated production of acceleration. And however, the, uh, uh, the new, uh, that, uh, but the digital technologies also create inequities, uncertainties, and new kind of things. The rise of automation and the artificial intelligence threatens the jobs and increases wage inequality. And the uh, new, new normal must not be the lens through which we examine our changed world. The normal has not worked for a majority of the world population. So why should it start working now? I mean, uh, we should use our discomfort to forge a new paradigm instead. It is not normal for the society in mass uh, to be isolated, but if this is normal, then we are supposed to have control of the situation. But if we feel loss or despair, we uh, are expected to get used to it, accepting that the, this morbidity really is now standard. So, I mean, stay at home orders cannot be observed by more than 100 million homeless worldwide. And the COVID-19 crisis undoubtedly brings extraordinary challenges to achievement of the uh, SDGs. It also brings extraordinary opportunities for solidarity. Multilateral actors and the countries uh, should come together to rebuild a better world and enhance healthy economic, social, and financial well-being for all. I, I stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shashutta. So. Thank you for the nice elaboration that the world population will continue to grow, though we lost many lives during corona epidemic. And that is the result of the population momentum. Thank you, Dr. Shashitu. So the, so uh, I, can do you have any do you have any questions the participants so that you can ask the questions right here by raising your hand. Uh, I think Reshmi Shah has got a question. I am allowing you to talk. Please ask the question. Reshmi, ask the question. Uh, good, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. I just want to know from Dr. Shashoto, 
that uh, he told that uh, child nutrition is very important in the case of this covid uh, covid 19 pandemic situation i just want to know nowadays homeschooling is started so uh, primary schools are also closed so in this case how it can be managed because uh, mid day meal is not possible to provide all the children so now how the nutrition balance can be managed yeah this is a question which uh, i am also struggling to think that i mean uh, how in in such situation where uh, there is a uh, problem with the transportation itself i mean how uh, we can actually reach to every household uh, for the uh, for the child and uh, and uh, provide that uh, mid day meal uh, i mean uh, there are states, I mean, in case of uh, Bihar has actually started uh, giving actually uh, ration to the home, uh, I mean, the uh, home delivery of the midday meal. But that seems uh, actually inadequate in terms of that, uh, you know, there is a large issue of the uh, accessibility issues. Now, uh, for the time being, it has to be compromised. I mean, uh, I mean, uh, and I don't have any kind of ready-made answer I mean to think of I mean the um, I am also thinking to what actually should be done in this case. thank you thank you sir thank you dr. Shashita so the world population will continue to grow though have lost many lives during corona pandemic and that is this is the result of population momentum so clear view of the toll of the COVID-19 pandemic is only beginning to take shape but experts estimate the human cost would be extraordinary. The economic and physical disruption caused by the disease could have vast consequences for the rights and health of women and girls. A new analysis by UNFPA and partners. Significant level of lock, levels of lockdown related disruption over six months could leave 47 million women in low and in middle income countries unable to use modern contraceptive, leading to a projected 7 million additional unintended pregnancies. Six months of lockdown could result in an additional 31 million cases of gender-based violence. Our next speaker is Dr. Shomajita Chakraborty, Professor and HOD, Department of Gynae and Obstetrics, Daman Harbor Government Medical College. She will speak on vulnerability of girls and women in relation to sexual and reproductive life during pandemic situation. Dr. Shumajita, please. Uh, thank you, madam. I must uh, thank IPHA for inviting me in this August gathering. Uh, may I request Dr. Shashwata to stop the screen sharing so that I can start mine. Take one. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, is it visible now? Yes. Visible. Okay. So I am a clinician. What we heard from uh, the esteemed speaker uh, who just spoke now, it's on the economic aspect. Uh, I will understand, I won't understand much of economics, but I'll share the stories in the pandemic addressing the issues of uh, sexual and reproductive health amongst girls and women. I work in a peripheral medical college which has been established not even two years back. So what we have done, what additional data I have gathered and few experiences I'll share. You all know, you all are public health specialists. You know that this sexual and reproductive health right, SRHR, it's, it's uh, 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 this, the, the, this has to be sustained even during the pandemic situation. It is a right for the women to have a sexual and reproductive health services that has been established long back. But we know this COVID-19 pandemic that has disrupted everything. We know very little about this pandemic, we must admit. It's a viral disease. 
how it's getting transmitted, why those symptoms are happening, the mortality is changing every day, recovery is changing every day, what should be the treatment, complications. We don't know anything. We are searching for the answer, but we all believe that we'll fight this battle and we'll come up as winner. So let us share a story which we know which happened 100 years back. That's the Spanish flu pandemic. It coincided with World War I. And World War I killed around 17 million people. And along with that, to, on, the, on top of this, there came the Spanish flu. It predominantly affected the young males because especially the soldiers, they were staying in close quarters, in troops. They were having the stress of war, definitely. They were suffering from malnutrition and thus had a weakened immune system. So they were affected more by the uh, Spanish flu in comparison to the women. And 175,000 more men died than women in the year 1918. So what happened? Less number of male were available to cater the service and then the women came up. The change happened, this paradigm shift happened due to effect of a pandemic 100 years back. 25% higher women came into service provision. It was around 21% before that added on this 25%. And there were some area which were exclusively held by men then the women entered, especially the example came textile industry. Then the women demanded equal pay and they gained the right to vote. This happened 100 years back due to the effect of a pandemic. We really do not know what is going to happen at the end of this pandemic after 100 years. So a few pictures from the archive, you can see the female are working in a factory and even in healthcare, they are holding the stretchers because no man is available. And we see the change now. Presently, globally, in healthcare sector, 70% worker are women. I used to commute to Diamond Harbor in train. I used to see so many AMs, ASHA, nurses, and doctors. They used to commute through the public uh, uh, convents train to Diamond Harbor that has been stopped in pandemic. Because restriction of movement is there, along with that we are afraid, we are tensed. Believe me, I can share one on a, of my experience which happened on the day of 24th March, that Janta curfew. One of my patient, she was supposed to supposed to get a c-section done on the sunday uh, on, on the friday before that she was scared but she told me madam will you do the c-section on tuesday i said no it's not possible on sunday she said okay i'll get it done on tuesday that's a better day that's a good day by uh, by the uh, astrologer said but she was too much tensed and she had pregnancy induced hypertension she landed up a day before with severe hypertension and unfortunately she had abruption, placenta was separated, the abruptio placenti and the baby died in utero. She was in panic. I was also in panic since she was previous C-section. I had to do a C-section on a dead baby and after doing the C-section, settling her, I had to go to the market to buy rice. We all had this situation when the pandemic started. Will I get the adequate personal protective equipment? That was a very big query at the beginning of pandemic. I started frantically ordering this PPE mask in Amazon, but Amazon also failed to deliver. That's the reality we all faced. Definitely these ladies, the 70% who are catering the healthcare, they are restricted at their home. Their household income will come down they will suffer from violence, household violence. And definitely those are part-time worker, contractual worker. There will be low income in the family, uh, less food availability, malnutrition in the children, and the breastfeeding women who are working. So we have to think of the female worker along with the patients whom we are catering in this pandemic situation. And due to this, 
uh, breakage of this convents, the life-saving medicine, there can be short supply. Administ uh, the administrators are trying their level best. I can share my experience from my facility to maintain this supply chain and also the contraceptive, there can be less readily available. I'll share what happened in my college. We used to do the maternal death audit once it happens. We had only one maternal death on 26th of January till the end of April. And that was a preeclampsia that happened at 24 weeks. So she must be having other medical issue. It was nothing related to obstetrics. But in the month of May, we had eight maternal deaths. Seven of them came in a condition when we had nothing to do. The health system, how much it's functioning, it's doubtful. Regarding contraceptive, this month, the first death happened yesterday. The patient gave, came in gasping state. She was a previous caesarean section mother. The officer who attended the patient said that she was having four months pregnancy and she wanted to abort. She conceived and she wanted to abort. She had some abort efficient. She bled severely because at fourth month, you have to go for surgical evacuation. She went for the medical method, procuring the medicine from somewhere. She was admitted to a private facility where she received two units of blood transfusion. And when she came to Diamond Hair, where she was almost gasping her last breath and she died. That's because of lack of availability of contraception. What Madam has already mentioned, let me reiterate, if the lockdown continues for six months, there will be 47 million um, women who will be unable to access the modern contraceptive, 7 million on an intended pregnancy, I can understand in my small practice, huge conception has happened. I, I really do not know what burden we are going to face in the month of January, February, March, and so on because of this extra load on population of this number. 31 million additional gender-based violence, 13 million of child marriage in next decade, and 2 million of female uh, genital mutilation. That has been extrapolated. So this SDG frame of even FPA, these three things remain unchanged. We have to end the unmet need of family planning. We have to end the preventable maternal death. Seven of the eight maternal deaths were preventable last month, but we couldn't prevent it because of the effect of COVID pandemic. And the gender-based violence, we'll have the talk on this uh, from our next speaker. So three priority area, there should not be any hamper in the continuous service in SRH, including protection of the health workforce. So we have to protect the people who are catering and we have to protect the people whom we are catering. Both are to be protected. The gender-based violence will, will have that talk and the supply of modern contraceptive and other reproductive health commodity that must be ensured leaving no one behind. There should be equity of care. I once again reiterate, I'm working in a periphery medical college where poor people are coming. They should be catered in the same way as people are getting the healthcare in a city. We must have our data. There should not be any break of data. Otherwise, we won't be able to understand what this pandemic had the effect on the healthcare services. And the young force, they must be utilized because of two reasons that I will say once again, because youth have more, uh, have a stronger immune system. They're less affected by this virus. This much we have understood. And they can be used as workforce to percolate the information. You have to wear a mask. You have to wash your hands. You have to wash your feet. You have to change your clothes. Don't roam outside unnecessarily. These informations must be percolated by the youth force. So leaving no one behind, there should be equity of care. Everybody, everybody should have this. I, I can share a story from one of the migrants at the very beginning of lockdown. She came to me in the hospital OPD and she said I was having some 
uh, irregularity of bleeding. I'm having some spotting. Uh, then I uh, went on asking. There was no uh, clinical thing, uh, uh, clinical abnormality. Then I asked about drug history. I said, did you take anything extra? She said, oh, my husband has come from Kerala and that's why we, we had a meeting and that's why I had to take uh, five tablets of OCPL and then I stopped. She was under panic and the thing is she didn't have the information that she should start OCPL and should continue. So these things are happening. I'm giving example of one. This is happening in hundreds and hundreds of women and the youth engagement. These are the reasons why we should ask the youth to come up and to in percolate the information to the general public in the society. So let me have a talk and I'll show you some pictures on the facility-based maternal care, what we are catering in a peripheral medical college. So three mottos from our side, we have to protect the maternity care provider and, and the maternal health workforce. Along with that, we have to provide safe and effective maternity care to the women and we have to maintain and protect the maternal health system. We must understand the system. Uh, let me share one of the experience from a previous meeting. That meeting happened in the last week of March where the additional district magistrate, everybody was present in Diamond Harbor Medical College. The first word I uttered that I have to protect all the people who are catering the service in the medical college. That's my first priority. I'll definitely give the service, but I need to protect them. So, and that was done wonderfully in our medical college. After that, we all, everybody, the doctors, the nurses, all workers are entitled to get one N95 mask per week from the store. They have to go, they have to sign a register, they get the mask and they can get the face shield. Everything has been arranged so wonderfully. I'll show you the picture. What we know about pregnancy and COVID, healthy women in the childbearing age group, they are not at high risk for moderate to severe infection developed by COVID-19. And it's not known to be more infectious than the general public. So it is not severe, not more severe effect of COVID due to pregnancy. It is expected that large majority of pregnant women will experience only mild to moderate symptoms and uh, similar uh, or may not be, may, may be absolutely asymptomatic. Till now, we had three positive patients in Diamond Harbor. Two were antenatal. Once they were diagnosed positive, they were transferred to Medical College Calcutta, which is a COVID hospital. And they are doing well over there. And one was a postnatal mother who delivered uneventfully. And after that, she went home. So till now, we know that pregnant women are potentially at increased risk of complications from respiratory disease once they get infected with COVID because physiological changes are happening due to pregnancy. There is more demand for oxygen. The mother has to supply adequate oxygen to the baby. And due to the effect of the pregnant uterus on the diaphragm, there will be less movement of diaphragm. There will be reduced lung function. So don't think once a lady is having COVID, she won't have any complication. Please remember her respiratory function is compromised. Uh, there is no evidence that this, there is increased risk of miscarriage or teratogenicity till now, but we have to have a continuity of data and we can say the final word after the pandemic is over with the retrospective analysis. And this is, has been demonstrated till now that breastfeeding doesn't increase the chance of transmission, but I have collected few data from medical college. I'll show you, but this study is also going on, not the time has come when we can comment it finally. There is no clear evidence of risk of preterm birth. We haven't seen any. And uh, product of conception, the placenta and uh, membrane, though they, those are not infected by this COVID virus. So disposal of this uh, after birth has to be done following the general principle. So what recommendation has come up from UNFP? There should be a triage and risk screening for every mother who is coming for risk of COVID. Risk screening has to be done by asking history of exposure and symptom. Everybody, the, the women who are coming to the facility for a delivery won't volunteer you about the risk of exposure or symptom. You have to ask. And it's always better to ask. If you ask somebody, uh, did you have fever? She will say yes. It, it, it should be in a negative term. Uh, did uh, you 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 must not have have had 
fever in last seven days? If she had fever, she will say yes. This, this is the way you ask the question. If she had fever, she will say, no, I had fever. But if you ask, so this is how you ask the question, but you have to ask it. The accompanying person must also be asked about general well-being because we allow one female to stay with the mother 24 into 7 inside the hospital. There should be a very good referral pathway for each patient. The referral has come down to almost zero. But whatever patient we refer, as I mentioned, two patients we have referred to medical college, the administrator must be informed. There should be PPE suit available to the ambulance driver, to other person who are accompanying. So referral has to be very much clarified and all the things must be in place. Women with suspected COVID need to provide with a face mask. That, that's the first thing. You should not forget to put a face mask on the patient. In the initial stage, one patient came with history of a fever. The medical officer rang me at 11 o'clock at night. Madam, madam, such a patient has come with such a history and having fever. I said, first put a mask on the patient's face. Okay. The personal protective equipments, long sleeve gowns, surgical mask, and this or the N95 mask. And during any episode of patient contact, you must follow all the routine infection prevention practices of which hand washing is most important. Surface must be clean by 0.5% hypochlorite solution and maintain a two arm distance. I took these pictures never with the intention that I will show you in a webinar. I took it long back. This is our OPD. On the left hand side, you can see she is the assistant professor seeing a patient. Patient is two hand distance away from her. You can see there is a basin. You can wash hands following examination of each patient. And here is the uh, examination bed. And this is on, uh, this is my room and this is me. We always wear a green gown. We wear the N95 mask, a cap and a face shield. This is how we see the patients. We are keeping the data of this comprehensive abortion care. You see it was around 100 in the month of uh, January, February, March. It has come down, but the service is continuing and we are also following the medical method of abortions. The service is going on. Now for the antenatal care, there should be a, a separate antenatal OPD. That's must. Shomajita. Yeah. Just uh, uh, shorten. Let's shorten her. Huh? Yeah, sure. The once again, the two-arm distance, clean hand, clean feet, waiting area with less waiting time and restriction of accompanying person. Uh, these all things I have mentioned. There must be smooth supply of medication and reduce the number of antenatal visits. It's not necessary the patient has to come after four weeks. You can make it five to six weeks. This is the picture from last month PMSME. Just have a look what, what has been done over there. Uh, stay home guidance. If the patient comes with a report of positive, but asymptomatic, patient can stay home. If condition worsen, patient has to come to hospital, but this home isolation can be stopped. So remember, if she has three full days without any NSAIDs, no fever is coming, other symptoms are improving, and seven days have passed. So they are having very mild symptoms. Don't be scared if you are tested for COVID, Positive, an antenatal mother, asymptomatic, can stay home. Intrapartum care, when the mother is coming to the labor room, once again, triaging and encourage the mother to inform the history of fever or this uh, movement, all these things, anybody in the family has suffered from. But you must treat each mother with compassion and respect. Sufficient supply of PPE is there, surface is clean, regular hygienic practice, and one asymptomatic partner we are allowing. In triage, whenever there is a history, we have done an isolation ward, we shift the patient to isolation, we have got isolation labor room, isolation OT. Minimum staff wearing the PPE suit, they cater this patient, and we try to separate the sick COVID woman from the well woman. It's a bit difficult. We have got two rows in that room. Women must uh, wear this thing and 
this is very important stabilize a symptomatic woman before referral this picture i took from the uh, camera of my hospital this is the entry this is the isolation ward through this door it's the doffing doning area and if you walk down the corridor you will see this is the labor room for the covid along with the operation theater this is opd on the other day you can see it's, i i took the picture in the morning at around 9 this is the SNCU. This is the inpatient entry. The security is standing. This is the postnatal ward. The mother is wearing mask. The security is wearing and cleaning is going on. I just took this random picture from my mobile of the hospital. Now, postpartum care, yes, it's a routine. Uh, now, many countries, they are practicing the mother to be separated from the baby because the risk of transmission of COVID to the newborn. But uh, it can only potentially prevent the mild illness that outweighs a number of benefits of this KMC and breastfeeding. The answer is not known to us. They must remain together and breast milk should be given. This data I got from Medical College Calcutta, which is an exclusive COVID hospital from 1st of May to 9th of July. They treated 191 female, delivered 113. There is high C-section rate, miscarriage, not much increase. These are the stillborn rate. There is no maternal death. I asked the SNSU in charge because you are separating the baby immediately, newborn immediately after the birth, but he's mentioned that the chance of uh, positivity amongst the newborn is around 35%. So remember to inform to all mother that you have to self-monitor yourself and once you see the sign of this fever, shortness of breath, do not hesitate to come to a healthcare facility. Staff with symptoms of COVID-19 should not come to work. We had positivity among staff and they are in isolation they are under undue stress that has to be addressed that has to be addressed i am not a counselor i'm not a psychiatrist but we try to talk to each other who are serving uh, especially the women the nurses the doctors female doctors who are serving this patient and those healthcare provider who are above 65 have got a number of comorbidity weak immune system preferably they should do office work rather than clinical work I end here with a few pictures. This picture I took on the day of Amphan in the morning from our hospital rooftop. So we know it's dark cloud which is over us. We don't know when we'll see the sun coming up, but still hope that the nature will refresh itself. This is on way to Diamond Harbor where you see the flower petals on the side of the road and migratory birds, packed of migratory birds. It's wonderful to see their flight, they're flying freely. And this, when we went for this relief camp, we believe that we'll come out clearing the dark cloud of this pandemic and life will go on in new normalcy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shumajita. It's very nice presentation, though we have little uh, different uh, experience. We are experiencing the same thing in our OPD also. Huge number of uh, MTP and huge number of unwanted pregnancy. Uh, but we, whenever we are uh, admitting the patient, we test them. Yeah, that, we, do, that, we, do that. we always test them. Yeah, yeah yes. Uh, I just make, will make a comment. We huh. have got the true net testing. Huh. And once they are admitted for any surgery, so they are tested and we get the report either huh. on the same day or on the next. Because as, as it is a community uh, transmission is started, yes. so no need of asking or uh, contact. True, 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 true. Thank you so much. You. So risk of quarantine measures increasing gender-based violence. Children will be more vulnerable to trafficking after COVID-19 pandemic, claims in a petition by Dr. Koilas Shatarthi. COVID-19 does not respect class, caste, stature, but it does hit the poorest, the precariat hardest. Similarly, child vulnerability triggered by COVID-19 will also not respect class, caste, or stature. 
while the rich children will be vulnerable in the confines of their home to cyberbullying, sexting, and abuse from elders and parents, the poor children will also be vulnerable to hunger, malnutrition, conscription into the labor force, and grooming and trafficking. And the poor children are more likely to fall through the cracks. I introduce Ruchira Gupta as our last speaker. Gupta began her career as a journalist working for the Telegraph Kolkata, Sunday Observer Kolkata, Business India Magazine Delhi, BBC South Asia. During her journalism career, she extensively covered women's rights, armed struggles in the Northeast of India, caste conflict, and minority issues. She continues to write extensively on sex trafficking and women's rights issue for various media. She moved on to the United Nations, where she worked with the governments of Iran, Nepal, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Myanmar, Indonesia, and so on. She supported some of these countries to develop national action plans and laws against human trafficking. She has written two manuals on combating trafficking for law enforcement and prosecutors, supported by UNODC and UNIFEM. Gupta also served as a UNICEF contact in October 2000 for the first ever gathering of Messenger of Peace and Goodwill Ambassador. Ruchira founded Apne Up Women Worldwide, where she has served as president since 2002. Though her, though her work at Apne Up, Gupta has given voice to the voiceless by organizing victims and survivors from denotified tribes, that is, labeled criminal tribes by the British, who are trapped in intergenerational prostitution into self-empowerment groups. She received various awards in the US and UK. So over to Ruchida for her talk. Thank you, doctors, um, all of you, and the distinguished panel of experts. I'm really pleased uh, to be here to celebrate World Population Day uh, with all of you. and. Uh, for me, it's been an education just listening to some of the data that you've shared and the anecdotes uh, inside the hospitals, uh, Dr. Shamujita, that was eye-opening. And uh, I have also been uh, trying to work in a small way uh, during this uh, lockdown uh, among victims of sex trafficking. Because very soon we realized that victims of sex trafficking in Calcutta, in Bihar, and in Delhi lost all their livelihoods, of course, because of in, during the lockdown. But also their children were sent back from school to the very rooms which were brothels. And many of these rooms have no windows. So there were 11 people to a room. The women had no livelihood. The children were in small rooms with no ventilation. If they stepped out of the rooms, the police were beating them up. Many of them have no documents because they themselves were kidnapped as children when they were trafficked into Sonagaji or Munshi Ganj or Najafgar or GB Road or in Bihar where I am right now in a small border town in Araria district. Um, and so they were facing police brutality in a deeper way. And sometimes, uh, you know, people who were dealing with porn and different kinds of uh, more violent sex were telling them that if you want to stay on in this house and you have no rent to give, you have to replace yourself with your child and offer your child for uh, making porn videos and online videos, which had started very quickly uh, during the COVID pandemic and during the lockdown. Um, related to the points you were making earlier that uh, you know domestic violence has gone up and also unwanted pregnancies and child marriage has gone up during the COVID pandemic, uh, what has also happened is porn news has gone up in India uh, in a huge way. India has become the third largest user, you, user of pornography in the world um, and much of it is violent it's not erotic and much of it is the use of girl children uh, who are being treated violently and uh, almost like violence itself is being eroticized so this has been going on in the red light areas and i found out about it three days into the lockdown when i got a message from a 12 year old girl uh, who we were sponsoring in a boarding school. And she WhatsApp me saying that she was back from school. She was stuck in this room. They couldn't even get fresh air and they had no food. And um, what could I do? 
So I put some food into the back of my car, some cooked meals and took it to her in the outskirts of Delhi in Najafgarh. Even as the chief minister kept announcing on TV that there was food to everybody and all of that, uh, they were not, clearly not getting it. So I took food to uh, that girl and I call her the last girl because she's really a metaphor for many, many girls across the country who have no access uh, to food. Uh, which is a very basic need and education comes next, protection comes next, uh, many things come next. Uh, and in Amphan, we've also seen uh, that shelter is now a big crisis. Um, so I took this food to this girl and her community members, 500 cooked meals, thinking it's a one-off uh, affair. And in a week or so, things systems would come in place. But very quickly, I began to get similar messages from Bihar, from Delhi, uh, from other parts of Delhi, from Calcutta, of course, saying they had no food, no food. And uh, you know the cooked meals were not enough because there would be a viral overload if I went every day or the community mobilizers of me up, my NGO would go every day. So we then switched to dry ration and we made a plan that for 100 days we would make sure that Hello, I'm, I'm in this village in uh, Bihar and so the internet connection is yeah. uh, very, very spotty. I'm so sorry about that. So we began to get dry ration kits uh, to the um, children and the women in the red light areas and you know we would try to give ration kits for a month and all of that and so far we've given away about 5 million uh, ration kits across the country and there were two things which I wanted to mention uh, uh, in this uh, conversation that uh, it seems as if there is a politics even in the food distribution um, and uh, the most vulnerable or the people I call the last in line are deliberately being left out of the food distribution even though every state government and the national government is announcing that uh, food is being distributed and this is for several reasons one is that of course many of these women and children in the red light districts have no documents or they don't have proper documents uh, required for the food they may belong to a different state because they have been trafficked or a different district or whatever secondly uh, the people uh, who are the authorities who give out food think they are disposable <laughs> There's a lot of background noise, I don't know what will happen. The third thing which happened was that I noticed that much of the food which the government uh, was supposed to give to these people was being given in certain localities, like it would be distributed inside a school. And people had to go there every day to this school or this temple or whatever the community center was to get the food. And many of these women were not allowed to walk there because the police would beat them up as soon as they came out of the brothel, saying you're not allowed to come to the out of the brothel onto the street. So it became an access issue. It became a discrimination issue. And then on top of that, at a systemic level, I saw that there were lists of people who were told that the food had been given to, because I used to speak to the subdivisional magistrate, I would speak to the ward officer trying to find out what was happening to the food. And food was being distributed in the name of some of these women and children, but not reaching them. And then when I started to trace back the supply chain, I found that the food distributed and then sent out from the Food Corporation of India go-downs, much of it is being siphoned off by some very, very big NGOs. And um, I don't want to polarize uh, anything, but there is a big hoarding of food going on with people who are close to authorities and they will release it maybe during election time, uh, you know, because they will control people through access to food. So malnutrition on World Population Day of the most vulnerable and the last girl is going to be a big, big issue which is going to face India. In terms of pregnancies that you were talking about, uh, there is unwanted pregnancy because obviously everyone is at home and um, domestic violence has gone up, but also a lot of sexual assault has gone up in homes and especially in small homes where uh, you know people cannot access police protection or child protection. And on top of that, abortion is obviously a, a safe abortion is not going to be possible because many hospitals are not treating anyone who's not related to COVID. 
uh, there is huge black marketeering in access to hospitals. Like you have to give money, deposits, five lakh rupees, this and that. People are scared to go to hospitals because they're thinking that they will get infection, etc. And then on top of that, in some states, what I'm finding out is that some girls are being told you have to get permission from a court to have an abortion. And this is something uh, which is beginning to happen more and more so in Madhya Pradesh and Uttar Pradesh and all these places. Uh, and, you know, how is someone going to get permission from a court to have an unwanted uh, termination of uh, an unwanted pregnancy? It's all becoming very, very difficult for this last girl. Then the third thing which is happening is related, of course, to education. These are first generation learners and uh, they are totally cut off from access to education. The mothers who are victims of sex trafficking have to take decisions like paying the rent or paying for the rice for that day. Sometimes they have to, they can't even recharge their phone. So these children cannot do these online classes, which every government is announcing. And so they are going to be very much behind by the time school starts, uh, uh, you know, and they will be both physically and mentally uh, left behind. Then, of course, in the populations I'm working for, there are mental health issues. Again, all of you have talked about it, but it's even more acute among the more vulnerable. And, uh, you know, they're in tight rooms with no ventilation. Food is an issue. They're facing eviction, many of them. They clearly know that it's not going to be business as usual, even after the lockdown is over, because, you know, it's a dangerous occupation. Prostitution is definitely not a sustainable livelihood. COVID has shown that it's dangerous both for the victim and for the customer. So what is going to happen? There is no humane policy that the government is thinking about, which is an exit strategy. And I have been talking to some people in different uh, cities across the world that what's happening with victims of prostitution in other parts of uh, the world. So for example, uh, the mayor of the Green Party in Amsterdam, what she has done is that COVID is an opportunity for her to know who is in the red light area of Amsterdam. And she has done the number counting and cataloging and she has created a transit uh, shelter for the women who are being evicted and who are being thrown out so they can go there with their children. There is childcare and there is nutrition and education. So there is a whole exit pathway and it's eventually going to lead to even small loans and starting other businesses. But in our country, there is nothing. They are, it's almost as if uh, there could be, some people could be disposed of almost as a method of culling. And I'm using very strong words, but I am right now in this uh, cluster of villages in North Bihar, and I just left Delhi and I've come here. And if I saw this in Delhi, you can imagine what I'm seeing in North Bihar. I'm in this cluster of villages uh, of, called Araria, Purnia, Katihar. This is where the massive migration has happened already to Punjab, Ladakh, Delhi of migrant workers who go four truckloads a day used to go. And all those migrant workers are back. Some of them are being taken back in buses by big corporations, but many aren't able to go back. I just met a mother today who said that, uh, you know, her husband is a construction worker. He's still in Delhi. Her two children are in Delhi. And they all live in a slum and she's here and there's no way for her to go back because the bus is charging 2,500 rupees or whatever for her to go back. And so her children are literally growing up with a man who has no income and no mother in Delhi right now. And both are daughters in a slum. When we think about the term, you know, the whole scale of sexual violence, which is uh, what uh, Dr spoke about and the figures in the UNFPA report, uh, you can think in terms of these micro stories, what is really going on in our country. And, uh, you know, public health is linked to um, public health systems. And each of these health systems are being dismantled uh, during the COVID lockdown. There is less and less investment in health. And so if, if the public health system is dis dismantled, how are we going to reach the last? Because there is more emphasis, COVID is being treated as a law and order issue rather than as a public health issue. Secondly, uh, even in, a, in the investment in health, there's investment in products. Everyone is talking about the vaccine, but what about the daily needs, uh, the health needs of people? Uh, on a daily basis, you know, I, there's another story I have someone, uh, a victim of sex trafficking, her husband died of tuberculosis. And, they, you know, he couldn't get access to any kind of medicines during the COVID lockdown.
So there are interrelated things also which are going on and uh, nobody is uh, looking at that. And so, uh, you know, we are going to face, because the COVID lockdown has also become a sort of uh, a period in which there seems to be a darkness. And in the darkness, a lot, because there's less transparency, there's less uh, people going out, writing about things and all of that. Obviously, we are scared of getting infected. But also what that is leading to is a lot of systems which our country has are being dismantled. And I think uh, we are going to face a deeper crisis than just the COVID crisis. We are also going to face a crisis of the closure and the dismantling of public health systems. And you know, the doctor before, Dr. Shamujita, I think from Ames, Dr. Sanjay spoke about, um, the, he spoke about Anganwadi, ICMR, <laughs> child protection. Anganwadi mothers in Bihar are marching every day for food before COVID. What's going to happen now? You know, and big multinational corporations, everyone I spoke to, and literally I have been phoning every day for my one million meals program. I call it one million meals, though it's crossed five million meals, asking, begging for food. Because I have no shame when I'm asking for food for the most vulnerable. And you know, it is the small business merchants of India who have given me food and said, we want no credit. A spice merchant in Indore who gave me haldi or a salt mer merchant in Kutch or a sugar factory owner in Sitapur and the big multinational corporations, they told me, oh, we've given five crores to PM Cares. Everybody has given away a lot of money to PM Cares to buy favors, to stay intact, etc. And they are the ones who are getting more empowered at the cost of a small merchant. So the entire food chain, one is that it's going to be controlled by the big five NGOs, uh, you know, uh, for the vulnerable at least, uh, as our uh, public distribution system will be closed down, because that's what I feel is going to happen, that food distribution will be privatized and using the COVID lockdown as an excuse. Uh, and um, for the vulnerable, they'll say, oh, we'll give it to NGOs to distribute who know the vulnerable. And they will be things like Akshay Patra, Art of Living, ISKCON, because we are going on being sent to them when I ask for food and ration. And uh, they will control people through access to food. It's, it's just the most terrible thing which is happening right now. And I just wanted to give you a report rather than talk about data and figures because all of you are experts. And all of you know better than I do the, the data, the, uh, the scientific facts. But uh, on the ground, uh, you know, the Indian Public Health Association, uh, we need to do a massive campaign uh, starting from just that our public distribution system should not be privatized come what may. Because I think that is what is going to happen very soon. And Reliance Fresh or whatever company, I don't know which company, but they will be the ones distributing food. So this is uh, one point. The second point is, of course, as, as I mentioned, about domestic violence and sexual violence, which has gone up during COVID. And uh, pre-COVID, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, since 2014, uh, the status of women and girls in India has become less um, you know, in every way, economically, uh, socially, and politically. So uh, if you read any of the reports which have come out, uh, even pre-COVID, you will know that there has been a drop of female employment in the workplace. And why is there a drop in the female employment in the workplace? Because, uh, you know, all the safety nets which women had so they could go to work are being removed. There is less and less budget allocation. So we used to have childcare. Everywhere childcare is going away. So how is a woman supposed to go to work? Who is she going to leave her children with? Then there were other safety nets. Uh, there was a skill training for women to transition if they migrated from a rural part of India to a, a urban part of India. They were given skill training. But again, that skill training is not happening either in the source area or in the destination area. So they are getting semi-skilled jobs. Some of them are being pushed out of any kind of job which has any dignity. So they end up in the red light areas, etc. The third thing is trade unions. Um, have become less uh, influential and less powerful. 
So there has become more work to be done in the unorganized sector because as there's a shift from uh, the organized sector to the unorganized sector, again, there, uh, you know, the representation of women is so little in terms of having a political voice and uh, the concerns are just not being raised. So that, uh, you know, uh, economically women are in a very tough position. Politically, what is happening to women are, is, uh, you know, that we are being pushed back to become the good woman who is the good wife and has the four children. So uh, there are pamphlets which are being printed, which are called Kutum Niyojan and all of that, in which very clearly it is written that, uh, you know, what should a woman talk? What are the clothes she should wear? Uh, she should not discuss politics and sports with the family. Uh, so everywhere there is a dumbing down. In some universities, there are courses in um, full, full certificate courses now which have been interest, introduced on sanskar, you know, so basically how to look, how to, what to wear, how to behave as a mother and all of that. So again, our uh, roles are getting more limited. And on top of that, what is also happening is that so our aspirations, which all of us, you know, and I can see two female doctors in front of me, somebody must have thought, yes, women should be doctors and uh, we will fight to raise that aspiration in these little girls when you were 14 or 15 to say that to make you dream to be a, want to be a doctor. Now the aspirations are again being dumbed down. And we are going to face a deep, deep crisis because if the, woman, if the child doesn't even think she wants to be anything, uh, can you imagine what that will translate into by the time she turns 18? And how few choices she will have left. And I know this because I deal with absence of choices. Prostitution, after all, is an absence of choice. It's not a choice. And I deal with what happens to women when there's absence of choice and the feminization of poverty. So socially, also, women are being pushed back into the homes. Roles are being redefined. Politically, uh, we know um, what kind of uh, a, a representation women can have and what they can do, what is correct and what is not correct. There is massive mobilization of women, of course, to vote. Because, and Bihar, of course, uh, Nitish Kumar won on the female vote in a big way because he had uh, played a big role in economically empowering women through the Jivika Yojana and the pink schools. But that's being reversed now. And why is that happening? Why is the, uh, what is the political assault on women is very interesting. On one hand, they are being asked to vote, but they're being asked to vote for the strong leader, the head of the family, the head man. So not be independent thinkers, but to become part of a group which is supporting the right leader and not be leaders themselves. And the second thing which is happening to women and girls across the country politically is that uh, they are being told to vote along religious lines. They are not being taught to vote as citizens. So they're not being taught the idea of citizenship, that how do you exercise citizenship? So many of the rallies which address women are actually, uh, you know, like a Karva Chauth rally on WhatsApp. On that day, 500 women will be addressed toge together by a man. And that's how politics will be translated into voting uh, categories. So we are, we, it's, a, it's a very regressive time for us at every level. And the way it translates into what impacts health is, of course, all of you are talking about it already. And these are very alarming statistics. Um, and then, of course, there is the violence, the relentless violence done to push women back home um, from the rapes that you're reading about, but the rapes with impunity. And the reallocation of blame to the woman that she must have gone out. Why did she do this, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to the trolling that women in, with uh, public voices face, uh, to um, the use of porn, which I've already talked about, which has gone up in such a way. So shaming women back from public places into private areas where they are isolated and they can be actually become victims of domestic violence more easily. So everything is shrinking and. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, it's like 1930s Germany or something like that, where we have a strong head, um, you know, and it translates from wanting a head, a strong head of the family, because you know we normalize gender inequality inside our families first, and then we normalize inequality itself, because it's at home we first learn it's all right for one group of human beings to order and one to obey. 
one group of human beings to seek approval for what they do and the other to give approval for the work they do and for others work and then gender digs a trench into our brain into which all other inequalities fall and then we go out thinking inequality is normal so then we begin to accept caste inequality class inequality race inequality all the other inequalities and we also begin to think that the head of the family is right even if he's wrong because he's right just by being the head of the family and that becomes our comfort zone and then we vote and we want a strong head we don't care whether he's right or wrong we don't want a gentle leader we want a strong man and that then impacts on our rights and then our rights begin to affect our basic needs and one of the basic needs of course is nutrition zero hunger sustainable development goals but also sustainable development goal 5.2 which is about uh, sexual violence and trafficking all of it is interconnected and unless we want to take on this idea of fascism from its very root which is inside the family we will not be able to take on fascism anywhere and fascism will not just cause the did not just cause jews their lives it cost catholics their lives also because everyone lost some people lost fighting the wars and some people lost their lives in concentration camps and women and children and of course feminists were the first 10000 people in auschwitz so it was the intellectuals and the feminists who were blamed the most and so here we are with unwanted pregnancy and i'm surprised that we don't have the levens browns but anything is possible and it's a very very dangerous time thank you i think i've said everything i want to say thank you ruchira thank you for uh, very elaborate very nice presentation and uh, really we are going backwards sometimes i think we are going backward so uh, she is our last speaker and i think uh, our uh, participants have many questions to our speakers i got few of them uh, uh, ma'am yes me, yeah ma'am this is from clarnet ma'am actually yes. yeah we are uh, have to play a video regarding mm -hmm. our institution organization so ma'am please permit us to play, uh, play the video okay so very short video ma'am thank well, you ma'am okay, okay. thank you ma'am thank you okay we have a few questions uh review do you want to ask speakers okay uh, thank you ma'am uh, so many of the questions were in the question answer box which has been mostly answered by the speakers themselves so thank you the speakers for working so hard even in the uh, while listening to this engrossing session Uh, I shall ask one or two raised hands who, to ask the question, uh, Dr. Niranjana Ghosh. Uh, I am allowing you to ask your question directly, so please uh, tell your question. Uh, you are you are uh, muted, so please unmute and ask your question. Thank you. Dr. Niranjana Ghosh, can you? 
listen to me what is the question you uh, anything so yes uh, yes raise your hand only so i am asking dr lutra okay dr. nilanjana lutra. nilanjana has asked how is the population dynamics going to be post covid okay okay who will ask dr shashit yeah uh, uh, anything about the population dynamics from uh, this very beginning will be uh, answering is really an issue i mean we we are not sure that uh, what is going to happen but the population dynamics particularly the uh, age structure it uh, it will definitely have the effect on the structure of the population particularly the and the elderly care uh, and uh, then i think i mean after you see the this uh, spanish flu at uh, 1918 after that uh, there were massive dislocations uh, within the families across the families across countries and so on and so forth so uh, the, uh, i don't think in the uh, in the era of uh, digital digital era this this kind of uh, thing will going to happen but it will it will have effect on the population dynamics particularly on the age age structure of the population thank you okay dr yes. shomajit do you want to say something I can't comment directly on the population dynamics, but but what I feel, what is going to happen, um, as uh, Dr. Shashakar has mentioned in his presentation also, AI is going to come up in a big way. That we are going to see in near future. Uh, see what we are doing now. That's basically the boon of AI. Yes, basic skilled workers must be there. They will be there, but their number will be cutted. Uh, somehow the population dynamics is going to be changed. What I can comment as an obstetrician, we are going to see a population explosion in the beginning of next year. But uh, as soon as the job security, the uh, chance of this, this earning and all these things will be cut, uh, gradually there will be a shift definitely in this reproduction and then the number of population and with the thing the young population they will remain and with covid the elderly are already affected so definitely there will be a shift there will be a shift in the dynamics there will be shift in the working pattern also okay okay uh, i i so uh, Ribu, uh, we can take this question bishnu dash uh, he asked we all agree that we have so many pressing issues in the current COVID-19 pandemic, but how to address this in a country like India? Uh, Dr. Shanjai Rai, uh, can you just answer this question? Dr. Shanjai Rai, where is he? Sir, is probably disconnected. Nee, he has uh, disconnected. He has got disconnected, okay, ah. okay. Uh, so, uh, maybe Shumajita Madam can try to answer this question. Well, uh, actually, Rivu, you will be the better person to answer. But I, I can say that both the physical and the mental health, especially the mental health, has to be addressed in a much stronger way. In the, there are so many pressurizing issue, health issues. Those are coming up. Uh, uh, I am getting feedback from one of my forensic friend that uh, what's the number of postmortem he has to do on each day. Yes, mental issue, issue mental health that has to be addressed. That area has to be addressed, uh, has to be stressed more than the physical issue what we are having now. Your comment, Rivu. Yes, uh, I think that uh, mental health with regards to all the healthcare workers uh, are having a tremendous mental health issue for the stigma and also the uh, general persons who are have to be locked down and they do not have any uh, like answer to what is going to happen. They do not have any timeline that what is going to happen. And all these uncertainties every day, the, there are meetings and every day there are uh, like new advisories. So this conclusion is giving even more anxiety and many people have to stay back home. So 
that is giving rise to more personal violence and domestic violence and more mental health issues. So, uh, as of now, I cannot give you any positive uh, points regarding which can improve the mental health in this COVID situation. I am only getting some negative points. Okay. So, the WHO and the MOHW has also issued mental health advisories. You can go through them, but at the uh, same time, I would like you to be getting connected with each other in whatever way you can and uh, stay together in whatever way you can, even in, over, over phone. And when you are having some problem, you know that you are having some problem, do not fail to get help. So that will be, I think, solve many of the issues. Thank you. Okay, Nehu, uh, he asked about the so many pressing issues. So I just add one thing. Uh, we have stopped OPD for uh, all the other diseases. And uh, People are dying for other causes also other than uh, COVID. So uh, immediately we need to start all the OPDs to decrease the loss of life. So that is one issue. And so last question I am just taking, no, no, not last question. Last question, Shushmita Choudhury has asked, my question to Shuchira, no, Ruchira ma'am, how do you plan to sustain the accessibility of vulnerable sexual victims taking the model of Amsterdam? Ruchit, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, How do you So, plan? I, so uh, basically what I'm trying to do is I'm releasing a report with recommendations. We are not seeing you. Oh. Is this? Yeah. Okay, so what I'm planning to do is to release a report uh, to the government of India based on my findings in the last 100 days. Uh, the report includes recommendations uh, from what I've heard actually from survivors of prostitution. What are the gaps? Uh, what are the problems in them being able to access food and what they want? The other part of the report is based on um, interactions with people in Amsterdam and other cities, uh, what they are doing to create humane exit pathways uh, for victims of sex trafficking. And uh, I am giving it to the Niti Aayog. I am giving it to uh, the National Human Rights Commission. And I'm giving it to the National Commission for Women. Um, and of course, I will release it to the press because I have no idea what Niti Aayog or any of these commissions will do. And uh, if they choose, then they can definitely uh, see what other countries are doing to create uh, humane exit pathways and uh, do the same because it's very easy. For example, GB Road has just 520 uh, families uh, who are uh, trapped in prostitution, which is 520 women and their children. Uh, considering the kind of money that PM Cares has raised, it will not be difficult. It will be just a few crore rupees to give 520 people homes and skill training and their children into boarding school. And, uh, you know, it will be a very good use of money from PM Cares. So I think we can do this. There are clusters of people in different uh, cities across and we have mappings. We have good NGOs. I have identified good community leaders. And through all of them, we can definitely use the Amsterdam model. The Green Party mayor will be very happy to give more reporting and more details about how she's doing it. But there's a possibility. In fact, this crisis is an opportunity if the government chooses to treat it as a people, pro-people opportunity, rather than uh, an opportunity to gain more control. Thank you. And uh, there are people who just want to help you and want to work with you, Ruchira. So there are few uh, in the chat I have seen. One is Dr. Luthra. So uh, they will contact you probably. Okay. So, and you can share my um, email with them. Uh, so yeah. that you can email me then, yes? Yeah. And this uh, video recording will be going to everybody. And uh, before s signing off, please fill up the feedback form for the e-certificate. I'm handing over this mic to uh, Dr. Kaushik. And before that, I... Thank you all the speakers uh, for giving their time, precious time in this COVID-19 pandemic. 
and within very short notice actually within one day so thank you so much i'm giving uh, microphone to dr kaushik you are not audible kaushik da unmute thank you ma'am we have come to the end of the second webinar organized by ipha another successful one so i thank uh, our president sir dr i have unmuted thank you ma'am can you hear me yes you are audible now thank you ma'am we have come to the end of another successful webinar the second of it organized by ipha i thank our president sir dr shantay kumar rai a sincere thanks to our secretary general madam dr shangumitha ghosh i sincerely thank our panelists for the day ms ruchira gupta dr somajita chakraborty dr shashwat ghosh and i also thank planet services for giving us this platform for organizing the webinar i sincerely thank dr ribhu basu and dr An anirban dolui for whom this webinar is again a big successful one and i sincerely thank all our participants all our participants have come to us in this webinar in a very short notice thank you all and thank you claudet thank you latika thank you anirban thank you joita